Hello, welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. Oh no, it's... I, that's me. No, I was setting my push to talk. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from the top. That's the problem with adding a name that... Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, hi. Alexis. From Belgium, hi. Alessio. Hello. Cara. Hello. And I am your host, Ben. We're going to be talking about a range of different topics from across the hobby. And today we'll start with the Standee catch-up. So, anyone want to jump in with what they've been up to? Any volunteers? Any volunteers? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll start. Um, for the past few days, I've not really been playing any board game. Or what I've been doing is um, planting stuff. I've been doing a, a lot of gardening on my balcony. So I have uh, lavender and mint and um, chive growing. And lavender and mint and um, chive growing. And I've recently been starting uh, growing mushrooms too. Uh, and today I've seen my first little... Uh, wisps of mycelium so maybe soon i'll have my own um reishi and shiitake and chanterelle it's going to be delicious i need and chanterelle it's going to be delicious i need to find a, a board game that deals with uh, mushrooms though so if you have any recommendation um there's 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 a dice based gardening one that i can't remember the name of right now but it was being raved about recently give me a moment um, <laughs> uh, before before i go uh we we've been growing in our garden um we've got uh strawberries and wild strawberries which are actually quite different um both of those are left over from the previous occupants uh, who we just neglected them over the winter and they decided to keep growing so good for them and we're also growing proper proper strawberries as well flower but i missed the window so i'll have to wait for next year i actually don't know the names of mushrooms in english so i i really can't contribute a lot to, to this discussion well well I'm cauliflower teach... is not a mushroom i'm gonna teach you one portobello that's the really big one well I'm cauliflower teach... is not a mushroom i'm gonna teach you one portobello that's the really big one ah, por... and that's yeah. portobello lane very famously there's a market in london uh, it's a great market you go to london you should visit it at least once it's crowded, sweaty. Uh, I bought a nice Van Gogh umbrella there one time. You, you know that... Uh, port uh, I bought a nice Van Gogh umbrella there one time. You, you know that uh, Portobello is actually an Italian word, right? Yeah, yeah, well, it's the same <laughs> words. There you go. <laughs> I can't remember that one. <laughs> yep, yep. And there's there's that famous song from that Disney movie. Portobello Road. That's Portobello the one. Road. In German, um, I, I think, think it is, yeah. would be like the crazy witch and her flying bed, or so. Yes, it's yeah, that it's one. Ben, that's bed knobs and broomsticks. Yes, yep, it is. Yeah, yeah, broomsticks is mazza di tambour in Italian. Uh, uh, actually, they are uh, manici di scopa, but there's not a name for uh, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a nice little song from an okay ish sort of movie with starring David Tomlinson and Angela Langbury. Yeah, that ends with uh, Scottish armors going back to life and taking back their country. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I haven't really been up to much. Um, I did meet my mother last weekend, which was the first private human contact I had for like eight months. So that was nice and weird. And that's great news. <laughs> yeah and weird and that's great news <laughs> yeah now i'm beat oh. i don't want to see humans anymore <laughs> oh. <laughs> <clears throat> now i just need to get used to it again it's, uh, it's been a long time but uh, yeah i'm looking forward to getting it back it's been a long time but uh, yeah i'm looking forward to getting it back to meeting people and playing games not on tabletop simulator 
actually this is uh, this is a melting hot summer I, I don't know if i want to to see people or stay at home fresh <laughs> true true it's it's incredibly hot and we are talking about the weather which yeah. is always nice <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be talking about the weather a lot in future years. I mean, we had snow here in spring. Oh, no. <laughs> not, not just a little bit, like actually multiple. Uh, also snow in spring in Belgium, which used to be something that hadn't been for at least two decades. So, You know, uh, my only trip to Sweden was in January because I had to visit customers in Gothenburg. And there was no at all. It was like uh, uh, a beginning early spring day. I think it was 2014. I just realized I don't think I have any board game that has the weather as theme. Ooh. It's often a mechanic in games. Th there's something called seasons anyway. <laughs> well, we recently played uh, Rap Cathedral, which is all about seasons, but not really about weather. <laughs> yeah, you, you have parks which of which we talked about, which has a lot of seasons and modifiers, but it's a mechanic actually, not a theme. Yeah, someone told someone told me something like that. Yeah, I think there is some game about climate change actually, but I have Yes, no that's right. Yep, yeah, yeah. Some people have been talking about it. I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet. Um there's a not very good game called Meteo. Build hotels and cruise ships and try and make sure the weather is idyllic for them. So hmm. you actually move the weather around. So that's a, Interesting. a bit different. Uh, there's a trick cape taking game that's apparently really not very good called Weather Slam. Uh, uh, Donna Wetter. Predicting the, the weather. <laughs> I think the one you're referencing is called uh, the Rule thir 34 of board games. If it exists, there's a board game for it. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there probably is, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Dune has a heck of a weather system in it. <laughs> yeah, there probably is, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Dune has a heck of a weather system in it. You know, <laughs> and um, I mean, we talked about Dead of Winter before, where literally, like, that big part of that is all set in the winter, um, which makes and the game extra miserable. Yeah, and the big part that deals with that. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and the big part that deals with that. Mm, yeah. Anyway, yeah, maybe that's something to look at in the future. But yeah, it'd be interesting to have like a uh, try and find a game where literally all you're doing is playing as the weather. Um, I mean, I played a fun little puzzle game a while ago oh. where, where you played a crowd on everything. Yeah, exactly. There was the one with clouds. Oh, wait, yeah. Um, um, oh, how is it called? Um, oh, I only yeah, know there's the, the, an there expansion was a with thieves and yeah. there's an, one with cows and one with clouds. And how is it called? Petricor. Petricor. We are... Oh, oh. We can't know about... <laughs> we can't know about all board games. We can't. There's, there's <laughs> so many of them. Yeah, I, I cannot even know some board games. I barely know the board games I have in the house. In fact, I don't. Sometimes they turn up. No, not <laughs> even those. Yeah, oh, there's Cloud Age, but that's like um, that's like um, that's not cloud based. That's just sailing around the air. Clouds is a matching game. There you are. Turn of a card, match cloud sections. So that's like you know a matching game. That's, okay. Uh... Okay. Let's go back to order. Let's talk oh, about oh. TV. No, mm. le 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 let's say one. Let's say one thing first, which is important. Actually, about oh. TV. No, mm. le le let's say one. Let's say one thing first, which is important. Actually, uh, I think it's about a month that we have a new Patreon, Christian, and I think it's uh, time to officially thank him for the support. We so thank, thank you. At the end you. of the last episode. <laughs> okay, I heard all the episode and I missed that part. The episode. <laughs> Okay, I heard all the episode and I missed that part. I have uh, very, very loud kids in the car when I listen to the episodes. I'm sorry about that. Alexis did, didn't you? Okay, yeah, you I did all these comments. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, don't, you don't get two thank yous. <laughs> oh, I did my mistake even for this episode, so we're okay. Destroy me. Okay, uh, right, well... 
Um, yeah, indeed. Talking about weather reports, we can uh, move on to talk about TV in general. So, Cara, would you like to tell us all about the first ball game of the podcast? Yeah, sure. Ooh. 16. Um, it's a 1 to 5 player game where you play the TV executives of different uh, TV networks and basically you try to fill your evening program uh, in a way that you get the most viewers out of it. Several seasons and um, you have to contract different actors and shows, put them into time slots and um, also run ads uh, for which you get paid and when you understand the mechanic you actually make a lot of money by it. <laughs> it took me a while to realize how they work but um, yeah so um, it's a card game and um, it's pretty simple to to learn and um, has nice mechanics though I feel like well, I feel like you really get most out of it if you are very knowledgeable about tv culture which i am unfortunately not <laughs> yeah yeah so um i i played this with cara and i um and my friend sam joined us and then also i i played this with cara and i um and my friend sam joined us and then i've also played this a few times before with um greg who really enjoys this game because uh he absolutely engages with the theme to him um yeah it's it's a kind of sweet little uh euro game it with uh euro game it with a definitely uh quite a, an ethnocentric sort of perspective if you're not not into the, uh, the television um you're not a heavy watcher of it or at least american television or british television in the case of one of the expansions yeah you can absolutely miss out on a lot of the you could engage with the mechanics which was meant that they weren't terrible once you, because, you know, if you peel, if you have a game with a jokey bunch of like, um, like Rob boss uh, as a star, you know, that kind of level of humor, if, if that's peeled off and the game still, you can engage with it, then thank goodness, because otherwise it's just a bad joke. Um, and it was funny from the team, from the theme for me, it was just, I didn't get the jokes, but, um, basically like the shows and actors and ads all reference real shows, actors and uh, companies and whatnot, but um, in a funny way, so uh, companies and whatnot, but um, in a funny way. So they are still funny, even if you don't necessarily get what they are referencing. So for me, it was just a, a couple of silly sounding shows um, and that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so some of the puns are, are quite and that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so some of the puns are, are quite um, quite fun. I actually have the get they physically have the game right here with me. That and the expansion. Um uh, so I, I should I should have opened it in preparation, shouldn't I? But yeah, you, you've got, yeah. You've got some, some nice little jokes like uh oh let's actually find one that I understand because the first one I looked at I went, I don't know what this is referencing. Um how I left your father. You know. That that's <laughs> yeah. a, yeah. Okay, that's or what I get. <laughs> yeah, or tiny pop hypothesis, which I liked. Once it's got a picture of Einstein yeah. on there. I would yeah. watch that over the show. It's actually ref not played network yet. Uh, I'm kind of wondering: is it specifically um, U.S. media culture, or is it U.S., U.K., uh, I don't know, Russia and Japan, or is it like very specific in terms of um, what type of media reference? The core game is very exclusively american um, like hopper idaho ranger um and so on like uh you'll get some of them for example there's a i, I just briefly uh, every show when you uh, get it has like four bars that tell you how well it performs in each season so it will vary on how they perform um usually they do quite well in the first season if you and some of them will do better in the second season and they might suddenly just drop off viewership in the third and fourth um but uh, yeah certain that the playful row of chair uh will definitely get trashed at the last season yes 
yeah. But uh, as I was going to get onto, th- you'll be able to get who this is. This guy, star you can hire for your show, and if you put, you can choose which way you rotate him. So you can either be two different ways up. If you orientate him in his normal way up, uh, he scores you like one viewer, one million viewers in the first season, two in the three, four million in the third season, and then nothing in the last because he dies in the third season. But if you <laughs> rotate him star for the show. So, of, of course, that's a famed British actor, Sean Bean, who dies in almost everything apart from Sharp, which he hasn't I, died in yet. I, I am checking the TV shows now. There's Criminal Mindfulness. I like that one, yeah. <laughs> Dextrous. <laughs> yes, with him juggling a load of body parts. There's, the artwork does a lot to help sell the, um, the jokes as well. I think it's a really pretty game. Oh, okay, there's the sultry sexy lady. I think uh, I think she's an actor, an actress. <laughs> yeah. Everyone loathes Raymond and wants to see him suffer. Yes, absolutely. It's Raymond and wants to see him suffer. Yes, absolutely. G- Wild, gosh, An- wh- Wild Animal Wrestling Federation. Where where I where have I been all this time? I I need this game in my life. I I I I love this game. I think as well it plays solo. It plays two, three, four, five, it scales very well because it's essentially a card draft. It plays two, three, four, five, it scales very well because it's essentially a card drafting game. But the shtick is that you're drafting, oh, you can only have three shows running at a time and you want them to score as many viewers as possible. And you're going to support that by putting in stars that hopefully bring in more viewers. And if you can, can adverts that will bring in money to pay for the fact that you're playing paying for stars and you're paying for shows and they may have ongoing running costs um it is pretty pretty sweet you 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 start off and you're like this is fairly simple i'm just taking a card a turn and then you get two three seasons down the line and you're bogged down in maybe like for my game when i play out of three players like (laughs) I sometimes felt like I was going to be in fourth place out of three. I did end up turning it round. I had a very good final season and and I won. Um, but I think it, it, if um, Cara had been more familiar with the final season scoring, where you score all the shows, age them, and then score them a second time, um, I think going. Yeah, that was definitely a mechanic that I didn't really understand existed until it suddenly happened um <laughs> yeah it's tough because i talked about it a few times but i knew from previous games that it doesn't matter how many times you try and explain it until somebody plays through it for the first time it doesn't click that that you have to score somebody plays through it for the first time it doesn't click that that you have to score then age and then score again but um yeah the uh i have all of the expansions um, Telly Time we mentioned we played a bit with that that has British shows so for myself and Sam that was a real like joy shows so for myself and Sam that was a real like joy to see these shows that either I'd watched or I heard of or my parents had watched like uh, Tem Enders which is just a reference to East Enders that that show never dies my mum's still watching it over in the UK of course T- tell me tell me there there's a dark viper or something like that <laughs> um you can also you also get the, the biggest most substantial expansion is the network executives and this changes the start of the game where you get a executive for the bottom half of your scoring board that gives you special abilities um uh, for example they are out of the office and for the entire first season, you're not allowed to bring in any new shows because you're busy. You're not at the office. Um, but you get benefits of being able to fix genres. And genres in this game are pretty cool. It's a set collecting mechanic where you get multiples of the same genre and then you get a bonus. So if you become the net that is known to do a medical show, uh, like the show uh, Home, for example, then you get a lot <laughs> Home. <of money. laughs> yep, Home fun. or um, Casualties. Yeah, or femur. <laughs> yes. I I just I just saw the card of the show Polly Age. <laughs> I just I just saw the card of the show Polly Age, <laughs> which I guess it's leverage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, the like the set collecting mechanic, which I just briefly mentioned, is pretty interesting. Uh, in the core base version of the game, when you pretty interesting. Uh, in the core base version of the game, when you get three of the same sc- uh, show, you get a bonus of your choice of either some adverts to get some money or a star to get into a show. Um, 
And then if you get five, you get like a really big bonus. Um, the uh, the really big bonus. Um, the uh, the uh, some network cards. And network cards are like special game breaking cards that you can pick up, and they give you either persistent abilities for the whole game. Or they'll give you like one-off abilities immediately or something you can cash in to get more points. So not only are you building this engine of get more points. So not only are you building this engine of network stuff, but you're also trying to grab network cards. And constantly you have this state of looking at the all the different cards and you're like, I'll get this. I will get this. I will get this. And somebody else hooves it up and you're like, uh, there it goes. Like I was too busy trying to get shows. I, I don't know. I, I really like this. I think it's cute and very cozy and fun. Yeah, I guess there is also a, a fair deal of player blocking, right? Well, you're constantly taking well, you're constantly taking stuff that other people want, and at a higher level, you could specific getting your station to run without being in debt and having to spend viewers instead of money. I'm guessing that the fact that the show is uh, that the the game is very funny and full of jokes means that uh, that that there's like a, a very good ambience around the the board, uh, since people talk and all of that. Yeah, yeah. Lo- looks like looks like fun times. Uh, how long is a game of the networks? Um, I'd say about half an hour per player. Okay, so a four-player game would be two hours. Yeah, yeah, about that. We, how long were we, Kara? I have no idea anymore. <laughs> but it I felt. Think how long were we, Kara? I have no idea anymore. <laughs> but it I felt we short. Around... It felt short. Yeah, it it flew by, but I think we were including rules explanation in under two hours for a first game. Awesome. Um, with three players. Yeah. We, which is pretty cool for a set collection game, actually. I, I think that uh, for a set collection game, actually, I, I think that uh, set collection without auction mechanisms are not that short. Yeah, uh, the box says uh, sixty to ninety minutes uh, with one to five players, so yeah, it seems fairly reasonable. When we played it four player, we definitely took this in a bit, but. Um, Greg is very, like, as I mentioned at the the start of this, the theme for him is everything. So he spends all (laughs) his time critiquing other people's networks. And uh, he was very harsh to me when I made a network about reality shows and sports. He didn't think very much of that. (laughs) If you do reality uh, shows and wrestling, then that's very much in team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, he could he could talk though. I mean, when when I played with him, he made a, f- a a damn network of sci-fi and action, and literally had a weeb for a star. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, come on, you know. Just because I'm making something with broad appeal to most most and lots of advertising opportunity, I'm not making fun of you for just specialising in your in your sci-fi network. <laughs> yeah. It's. I also just briefly say when. It's. I also just briefly say when it comes to the um, box, it's like you know the GMT boxes. That's the, so it's very thin, um, and rectangular, so it doesn't take up a lot of space on the shelf, which is nice. Yeah, I think I have. Yeah, I think I have a Sekigahara, which should be published by GMT. It's actually a thing I can say about the box is that it actually fits way better than the content. So it's great for that purpose. It, let's say it is a bit disorganized, uh, not organized internally, but the box it's fit for any shelf. Yeah, when you try and fit all the expansions in and everything, it's a mess. Okay, but... it's worth mentioning Rival Networks, the recent game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kara didn't have a chance to play that. I've played it a few times. It's It's got the same theme, and it's got some of the similar mechanics. You'll get stars, you'll get adverts, you'll pick up network cards, but it changes a lot of stuff. You're directly competing head-to-head over viewers for each time slot, 8pm, 10pm, 11pm. Um, and uh, you're, you've got goals at the end of the game to score points on instead of just the highest number of viewers. The game to score points on instead of just the highest number of viewers wins, um, which mixes stuff up a lot. And there's a few other wrinkles. For example, uh, adverts now don't give you money. Instead, you discard them to pay for network cards. 
so it's it's its own beast with the same theme, which is interesting in itself. Uh, beast with the same theme, which is interesting in itself. Uh, it's definitely um, a bit weird to make the transition between the two games because you're kind of like you look at it, everything looks the same. You're like, I know how this works, and like some of the mechanics work the same, and you're like, ah, I know where I am, and then suddenly it curveballs you, and you go, oh, what? Okay. Very, very, very streamlined of the same game. Yeah, yeah, it's very streamlined. It's changed a few things. Uh, it's done within 30 to 45 minutes for a two-player game. Which is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I was interested in it. I, I missed the Kickstarter. Actually, I had to renounce it back then because I, I don't know what was up day or another around these days. It's on sale locally for me. So, yeah. I did cool. back the Kickstarter. I picked it up from retail. That's pretty cool. Mm. Uh, speaking of Kickstarters, so um, Alexis, would you like to tell us about another Kickstarter game? Of course, month now my to-go game to go see my parents, and it's Project L that I backed on Kickstarter, um, I think two years and a half ago, something like that. It's a tiny game that we already mentioned quickly in the um, BGG Awards uh, episode, and it's rightly defaults its day, its uh, episode, and it's rightly defaults its day, it, it's it's um, place there. Uh, basically, it's a game about Tetraminos, where you have a few cards, uh, puzzle cards in the in the front in between every player, um, and player starts with a certain player starts with a certain number of tiny Tetramino pieces, and as the game progresses, there they can either take uh, a new puzzle or uh, upgrade one of their pieces. So, for example. Uh, a one bit piece becomes a two bit piece, but they always have different. And as the game advances, you need to fit to, to get a proper hand of pieces to fulfill the cards that you get in front of you. But there's also like a couple of additional rules that will mean that, for example, when you finish a puzzle, you get to immediately take a new um, Tetramina piece. And so as the game progresses, that it's not exactly an engine building game, but there's just a few elements that make it a little bit more complicated and um, interesting. I think it's a it's a pretty pretty cool game to to have at hand. Uh, I definitely really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's uh, that's been my, my really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's uh, that's been my my little experience with it. Uh, I don't know if anybody else played it so far. Actually, I checked the print and play version. And I was trying, since I saw a lot of people trying to do that, I was trying to 3D print my own print and play version. So a lot of people trying to do that, I was trying to 3D print my own print and play version, but not yet quite, not quite there yet. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I love Polyomino's games. I, I don't know if it's time to give the boring actual actually it's not the Trimino's part. <laughs> <laughs> because well, why not? Go on. Go on, educate us all on the difference. Okay, so you feel free to go to sleep. Basically it's a polyomino game because a Tetrimino is a, a is a piece made for cubes. While a polyomino has uh, more as any number of cubes, since uh, in Project L you have uh, one uh, pieces from one one cube, pieces for two cubes, three and four. It's actually polyominoes. A game like Tetris, in uh, on the other hand, it's ju it's just every piece is a tetrimino, so they are actually properly tetriminos. Okay, so did you lose me again? That makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> So now I feel really stupid for asking, but I mean, I learned about this game like an hour ago. So um, when I look at it, it was, oh, cool, it's Tetris the game. And now I learned, no, it's actually specifically not Tetris because it does have... It's Polyominos is the game. Um, yes, I, I think that it is that you can, if you introduce it to your friends or your family as Tetris the game, uh, people will get it. Uh, different than Tetris because you're not trying to do lines, you're trying to fulfill specific puzzles. But I think that's a great way to, to have that in front of a table because if it was you just know, fixing a lane, should... it would be pretty easy, I think. Yep. 
I should hope you're not trying to do lines when playing. Uh, this... Bonjour, bonjour. Oh, someone, uh, someone joined. Trying to do lines when playing. Uh, this... Bonjour, bonjour. Oh, someone, uh, someone joined. Oh, Hi. Th there's someone else. Well, we're learning all about Project L, and apparently you're supposed to, you're not supposed to do lines while playing it, which I think is good advice because that may distract your concentration. <laughs> and gone. <laughs> oh, she concentration. said. <laughs> and gone. <laughs> Oh, she bike. said she 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 podcast bombed us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, David like got swept away by a flood recently. So... Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, why not? Um, I I've been trying to get this and what? Um, I I've been trying to get this and I cannot. Like the the pre order link on Board Game Geek pushes across to a Polish website and. Uh, I, I I can put all my details in. I put everything in correctly, and it will not let me like pre-order the game at all. That's a which shame. Which is very frustrating at all. That's a which shame. Which is very frustrating. I can yeah. imagine. If you if you want, maybe we can uh, we can find a way to to fix that. Yeah. Uh, yeah order okay. it to uh, uh, somewhere that they accept you to send it. I know that they definitely managed to to get my version. So. Yeah, they said they shipped to anywhere in Europe, and the shipping thing is that the process it's not progressing. Like it's not um, activating the confirm and move on to payment options. Uh, so I don't know. I know what's doing wrong because I, on three separate days, retried it and it didn't happen, which is a shame because I, I do like games like this. I enjoy Isle of Cats, which recently finished its kicks. It's not super amazing, but it is, it's, it's fun. It's something uh, about these shapes that are very enticing. Yeah, it's. It's a really fun game in in the the physical way. Like the the pieces just makes you want to put them in your mouth. The the whole thing is nice. The little puzzle cards have indentations, so that when you put them down, I have indentation in my cards. That's my uh that's my weak point. I love double layered cards. <laughs> yeah. Like like that that was one of my criticisms about um what uh Wild Ascent was that they didn't double layer their player boards. It it makes everything so easy. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice to just have spaces where you slot things in. Like terraforming, you get yourself your own double layered like cover for it, or you set that up. Then all of a sudden, the game's so much cleaner and easier to use. So having a, an actual mechanic where the whole point is to slot things into holes sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, la like in Beyond the Sun, when you get the technologies and stuff, and you are happy because everything is double layered. And on the card, the card is not double double layered, and so it's a bummer. Can you imagine like getting a deck of double layered cards <laughs> like having to shuffle I, and deal those out i i think that uh, that uh, so you have been eaten uh, as promised uh, at triple layer stuff yeah we'll have to see when that that arrives um, triple layer stuff yeah we'll have to see when that that arrives um i think that the biggest um advantage of this game is really that it's tiny the the price point is i think under 30 euros um shipping included in a lot of places um and it's just a it's a very um and it's just a it's a very tiny box it's uh it's around the same size as my, as my hand it doesn't weigh that much so it's something that's super transportable it plays in under an hour and because the um, the condition to win is the amount of cards that you put in the game. You can easily adapt that a little bit. And I just think it's a it's a perfectly sized and played uh, games like this. I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, it, it feels like it'd be quite accessible. Very easy for people to get into. How challenging does it get? can get pretty challenging since uh, around the mid-game to the late-game, what becomes more uh, important starts to to be really like planning two, three moves in advance, sometimes um, also looking around the, the board to see what the other players are going to go for because you want to get... Um, so there's a... An interesting, uh, I think that there's like some nice uh, challenging mechanics and there's one expansion, I think it's called Ghost Pieces, I would need to, to double check that, um, that basically adds a few more um, end game rules, a few more um, end game rules basically. Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's pretty neat, like if you play the game 
enough. I would definitely say that the the expansion is a is a good second buy because it really adds just an extra layer to the game. Yeah, they've got two extra layer to the game. Yeah, they've got two expansions that I see listed. Um, ghost piece, indeed. Uh, Special fight level five ghost pieces in a sit room for six player games, and there's also finesse apparently for uh coming out this year. Uh, oh, yeah, ultimately, yeah, yeah, and then apparently there's a an ambassador pack, but I suspect that's uh that's something different. Uh, I think that the ambassador pack expansion. is the um the Kickstarter um like bonus stuff that you got, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. I think that the best part of the game is is it that it plays so uh yeah that too it's uh it's really fun to play solo it 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 plays well at any number of players there there's a few games where you know they recommend to pl- they they say that it can be played with two or three players but they they're basically um not playable unless you have five or six. L is the kind of game where if you play it solo, it will be very fun. If you play it with two players, it will be very fun. If you play it with three, four, five, six players, it will always be fun and always stay quick because the decisions that you're going to make are going to be very fast and snappy. Um, There's tactics, but it's never really to want to to think too long about. Um, I Yeah, it's a, it's a big recommendation. And uh, in my opinion, there's a very good... Um, reason why it was in the uh, BGD Awards. Yeah, it's everything I've seen about it. I'm excited. As I say, I've been trying to get it. It just doesn't isn't there yet. When playing solo, um, is it like do you have a goal or is it like hey, you got sixty points, so you are mediocre, or? <laughs> I always love it when it has point scores like that. You have to compare <laughs> yourself to some table. You suck. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, the, the game's... I don't know that game. <laughs> oh, it's a game when you roast beans of coffee and you make an end scoring and that actually you can score pretty, pretty poor. Okay, so yeah, so in the end it's just you try to beat your own high score. Yeah. Any Anyway, actually, I would uh, like to know uh, an answer from Alexis, because I actually uh, have a soft spot for the Polyominos game, but uh, for the special puzzle, actually, but uh, I, I never... Th- there's always something which uh, isn't quite right. There's always something which uh, isn't quite right. Uh, you can't play a lot solo, it's not exactly like a roll and write, uh, you would play better with a roll and write like Railroad Inc. So since uh, this one got uh, a recommendation, especially for solo Railroad Inc., so since uh, this one got uh, a recommendation, especially for solo, I am exceptionally curious and that's what drew, drew me, drew, has drawn me to this game. <laughs> Yeah, um, and also as uh, Alessio said, there's a print and play version. I'm 99% certain it's during the Kickstarter. So if anybody is interested, I mean, there's always the BGG version, I think. But if anybody is interested, just give a try to the print and play version. Yeah, give it a try. It's uh, it's uh, uh, officially licensed, or at least I got it from uh, an official share the for the time of the Kickstarter, or if you can have uh, any time, but should be free and free to use. Yeah, I don't think I've heard of somebody release a print and play and say you can only print and print this if you get it within a certain win- time window. That's if they ever do that, I don't think that they understand how the internet works. Print and play has expired. So yeah, they'll be putting together fungible print and plays. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So go 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 ahead and print your own resin version of the of the game. You you environmental monster. Well, yeah. Who knows? I'm uh, I, I'm not going to print my own. <laughs> well, yeah. Who knows? I'm uh, I, I'm not going to print my own. <laughs> it looks too nice. The, the 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 you know the copy that they've made is just too too clean. Yeah, um, it, it was a little bit late on the, the Kickstarter, but I think that they really did uh, an amazing on the, the Kickstarter, but I think that they really did uh, an amazing um, 
an amazing work on it. And uh, I think that the, the team behind that game is definitely uh, one to look after. Yep, definitely. Definitely. We'll keep an eye on stuff from them in the future. If yep. uh, if anybody wants to go for stuff from them in the future. If yep. uh, if anybody wants to go for special puzzles, there's a kind of different on the same uh, genre, which is the Looney Pyramid series. Uh, they are games which range from uh, uh, kind of bad. Uh, they are games which range from uh, uh, kind of bad to very very cool. Uh, there are, I think, six or seven games based on these 3D pyramids. There is good stuff, there is bad stuff, but everything is there. Uh, it's reviewed and there are very opinionated gamers. Uh, opinionated gamers. Uh, yeah, special puzzles are cool. Yeah, they're mostly known as the Ice House games because that was the first game that introduced the pieces. But there's a e lot of them now. Yeah, exactly. There are, I think, three, three seasons of Looney Pyramids. Uh, and Kara was showing earlier from Windows, I think. Yeah, um, it, 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 it made me think, uh, Project L made me think of Catacombs Cubes, uh, which is, I don't know, I, I think I, I don't have, I haven't played Project L, but it feels to me like Project L is a, like a smaller, more get into and um, play, a 2D version of Catacombs Cubes, um, which has basically also puzzles. It has a theme. You like you build a city, and you draw cards, which show you how a building is supposed. Uh, these 3D pieces, and uh, you have to collect the pieces and build the buildings um, to score the card. So since you're building up, uh, is there also like a, a sort of um, a Jenga type uh, mechanic where if, they, if it falls, it's... Yeah, um, I'm theoretically, yes, practically. Um, I mean, they do have the rule that you the building has to keep standing without you touching it for like three seconds or so. But um, when I played it, that was never an issue because the... Uh, the buildings they work really well and i like mostly three or four uh, blocks high and so it's it's fine um and yeah so make me think of that but it's a bigger box and it's really heavy because it has this, <laughs> these really big i can imagine yeah wooden pieces uh with, especially if you play with children but not so great if you want to carry the box around <laughs> Oh, I saw the game board. The game is huge. Every game is transportable if you are motivated enough. If you are brave enough. Yeah, I, <laughs> I remember hauling around uh, the Kingdom Death Box to friend's house. And it's definitely not a game that I would ever call transportable. The, there's that there's that Gloomhaven with the 13 cards, 18 yeah. cards. <laughs> Gloomhaven is easy to transport. I, I used to transport Kingdom Death across two cities. So yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. If there's a will, there's a way. It's pretty. This it's really pretty. Although the buildings um, look like a mess, I wish all the cubes were just not coloured. I imagine that helps though. Yeah, I mean you don't. Which is a real, little sad. You don't keep the buildings. You basically build one and then you raise it again and build the next one. This one. So oh. the colors don't matter as much. I mean, the so colors are a... there to distinguish between the pieces, but... Um... So it's a bit like Tiny Towns. So once you've constructed the building, you're replacing it with a representative of that building rather than leaving the pieces there. I, I was wondering how much it took you to mention it. It looks really cool, pieces there. I, I was wondering how much it took you to mention it. It looks really cool. Oh, uh... I have to um, I'll have to keep an eye out to see if that one ever turns up for a nice price. Oh, again, it plays solo apparently, so that's very much a theme for today because the next game I'm going to talk about is one which I which I mentioned in the last podcast, and it also can be played solo, as in every single game we talked about on this podcast can be played solo, apart from the rival networks, and that is uh, Destinies. Now I'm not going to talk about this one for too long because um, Ultimately, uh, I I have game, but uh, I said I'd talk about it here, so we will. 
Uh, Destinies is a one to three player competitive role playing game. It's the the pitch that they've gone for. Um, it was a relatively successful Kickstarter. Uh, it's reached retail and the retail comics playable as is. It's quite affordable as well. Not not expensive, especially given that it's got a lot of little plastic miniatures in the box. But when you open it up, you'll realize they're very little. So the conceit is this. One to three players. Weird number, I know. There is a fourth player expansion box, which I find a bit... At least the fourth player is an expansion. But one to three players will sit down to play a scenario. Uh, it uses an app for the vast majority of the play. The app is brilliant. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit more about it, but just because I normally quibble about apps being in games, I'm just going to say that the app is really good. Uh, and you'll set up the scenario, you hang in the middle, and then some other tiles face down, which show faded out versions of stuff in the distance. You'll start up the app, you'll pick a character. Uh, there are three choices, typically. Um, in the first scenario, you can play as a hunter, a witch, or a noble. Um, then the game will tell you which model to get to pick up to represent them. You put that on the, your um, starting stuff and stats are. And that's one of the cleverest things about this game is the stats. So you have three, red, green, and blue. Um, if I remember correctly, blue's knowledge and red's power, and I always forget what green is, but effectively they're intelligence, strength, and dexterity, you know, which is the ones we're all familiar with, and dexterity, you know, which is the ones we're all familiar with. Um, but the, you will get a number of, of pips that you put on this little track on this lovely double-layered board, and the discs just slot in. Now... The neat thing is, is those four discs or three discs represent your skill in that particular... Four discs or three discs represent your skill in that particular area. So, say in knowledge, you could have a three, a five, a six, and a ten. When you do a check, you roll dice, and for every uh, every number less than the, or equal, equal to or less than the number you have rolled, you get a success. So, if I, I've got three successes, the ten is not a success. During the play, these these will slide up and down all over the place, and you you aim to try and lower them. Uh, you can also boost your checks by using these one-off work dice that you gradually generate one a turn, or you can eat food to get all of them. Um, and effectively, that's all you need to. It sets up. It tells you how to set everything up. It tell you know you, to navigate around the map. You'll click on the tile. It'll tell you flip it over. If anything special happens when the tile flips, it'll tell you to do that. If there's any locations to interact with, it'll pop them up. Uh, any miniatures you put on the board, it'll reveal them. And the vast majority of the gameplay is all set up in play. Is all set up inside the app. Even tracking like hidden things as to how many turns before something happens. So, I gotta say. All of this, mechanically, I wish Seventh Continent was doing this. Honestly, if Seventh Continent had this app instead of that giant pile of cards, I would still be playing this app instead of that giant pile of cards. I would still be playing Seventh Continent right now. Straight up. Like, the Ooh. app is brilliant. That's a uh, bold it, affirmation. Yep, yeah, yeah. It's it's just taking so much heavy lifting and just makes the game really easy to get into. And you're set up and ready to play very quickly. Makes the game really easy to get into. And you're set up and ready to play very quickly. Uh, and ev everything just makes sense. You kind of go, all right, well, I'm going to go to the uh, inn and I'm going to steal some gold. So you'll make a check against your green trait. Call it uh, talent, I think it might be now. Now I'm thinking about it. Uh, if you and it's, uh, Talent, I think it might be now. Now I'm thinking about it. Uh, if you, and you take how many successes you've scored. And then, boom, you, it tells you what the results are. And, and that app is doing so much great work. Now, here's the rub. Hated it. If you replace the cards from Seven Continent with an app, if you replace the cards from Seven Continent with an app, you don't have a board game anymore. You just have an app. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but that's effectively what you've got here. But you still have a physical board game. But not all the cards. I, I mean, like, all of the... Like, if Seventh Continent, if you go to um, a, a place and, you know, you interact with a, a, a yeah, yeah. something, the app. I do agree, you'd pretty much have just an app, but you could have the tiles. You could have the survival deck still for all of the actions and successes you're generating. But the rest of it could all be behind the app. Basically, all the events and such. Yeah, but one of the, the biggest argument against it is that, you know, it's basically an adventure game that you more than most board game. Yep, yep, certainly. Yeah, but anyway, okay, so 
as I was saying, uh, there's one problem. We hated it. Oh, that's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, not the mechanics, all right? This this game is sweet as heck, and with a better set of writing, it would be incredibly enjoyable. We played two of the scenarios, and after that we were like, we don't really want to play anymore. Um, in the first scenario, uh, I, I didn't know what my character was going to be like. I just picked one of the ones, and as the scenario unfolded, I realized my character was a complete, complete asshat. Like, really obnoxious, awful. Basically the bad guy. And I didn't really want to be winning. And and, and so everyone else who's playing was kind of like, oh, uh, oh, geez, like, they're struggling. And I, everything fell in place for me. And I got to the end. And while I'm doing the actions of the end piece, I'm like, I don't want to be doing this. Like, I'm just following through the motions on something, something that uh, this is not what I wanted. Uh, because the game obfuscated what the destinies that I could have chosen from were. But I, I got the feeling both destinies were kind of not great. Um, so maybe it'd be more fun if I played a different character, but in the other scenario, I had a similar problem. The biggest issue is we get to the end, and the story is uh, some of them maybe <laughs> die. And it's like, whoa, talk about walking away from this game with a really bad aftertaste. So is this like a competitive game then? Yeah, it's competitive. You're racing. You, you, you. I didn't. As I was brushing over this, uh, you, at the start of the game, on the back side of your character card, you have two destinies, and they'll tell you. Some, I had to either get three items with the keyword ritual or three items with the keyword silver, and uh, it, it, then then I would fulfill my destiny. Um, and I then had to go to a location and start the end game, and everyone else would get a bit of a warning that oh dear, the hunters in the end game, and. Um, and sure the hunters in the end game and um and sure enough i was and at that point it was impossible for anyone to catch up because i just kind of steamrolled through all of the final end events there was wasn't even a chance of me failing because of the way the game had panned out um i will say i think maybe this might be better if i played it solo i will say i think maybe this might be better if i played it solo because yeah, maybe. then I've got, like, I can just play the character, play through the destiny, and then I can even replay that same scenario playing a different character, or even the same character with the other destiny. And yeah, sure, I'll get familiar with the map and come to understand where all the bits and pieces are. The first scenario, for example, is only a, I think it's a 9 or 12 tile board. It's very tight. It doesn't expand off anywhere. Um, you certainly know where... You, what you yes 12 tiles you know where you're going with everything so maybe this is a, a game i'd recommend playing solo and if you don't mind a game where at the end of it people who lose are basic then maybe it's okay for them as well but, uh, <laughs> but we we did not enjoy it um we do play competitive games occasionally um and can get quite cutthroat on them but at the end of this one i felt bad winning and everyone else felt bad losing and we were just like well, I guess we should play one more scenario to make sure that it's not, not just a one-off. So I think maybe the writing is the problem here. Because I, I, throughout it all, I was like, oh, if Seventh Continent's writing was with this app, I would, I would still be playing Seventh Continent. I'd be playing it like several times a week, for sure. Okay. It... For sure. Okay. It has several expansions, which are more scenarios, but I think that they are more of the same, more kind of like that. Yeah, they're more scenarios. Who knows about the writing? Better writing, better writing on scenarios may change things a bit. Better writing, better writing on scenarios may change things a bit. Um, it's it's hard to say, but uh, I don't think I can give a recommendation to this one. Um, I'd also say the miniatures. Don't get this if you want to like paint miniatures because they are like nine millimeter tall. They're tiny, which is when you're on the board, you're squinting and going, "Is that woman? Is that the witch? Or is that the maid? Or is that the gypsy woman? I can't tell. I've forgotten which one my piece is, because they're all the same homogeneous grey. And even certain models are like interchangeably used for multiple different characters in different scenarios. Saves money, <laughs> but. I think another thing to to uh, mention here, um, you said it's one to three players and there is an expansion for four players. However, while one to three players is strictly competitive, four players is specifically two versus two. So um, that's maybe something to keep in mind for people who versus two. 
So um, that's maybe something to keep in mind for people who think it might still be for them, but they want to play with four players. It changes the game probably a lot. Yeah, I, I, I feel a bit annoyed as well that they put the fourth player behind an expansion. Like, I, I feel a bit annoyed as well that they put the fourth player behind an expansion. Like, I, sometimes games put, say, the sixth player behind an expansion, and I'm okay with that, like, five, or maybe even the fifth player. But a three-player game's a really weird number to start with. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially since most games play at four board games. My groups always have five. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a problem. Um, and not every game has a good rules for five players. Sometimes they just throw their hands in the air and say, play it with five player and see how it works. Anyway, I find it interesting that uh, the four-player version plays sharing a victory and not feel bad. Yeah, that could not be a bad thing. Okay, that definitely sounds like a good game. Okay, and well, that brings me on to the game I am going to be talking about, which uh, by now a written review should already be out for. This is the 1-5 to five player infused with Detective of Modern Crime board game, Detective of Modern Crime board game season 1, or uh, the other one, Detective of Modern Crime board game expansion LA Crimes. This is an entirely different detective game. Uh, I'm going to call it City of Angels for the duration of this, to just distinguish it from the others. But duration of this, to just distinguish it from the others. But this is a 1940s crime thriller board game in the vein of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective uh, like the video game L.A. Noire, so it's got a heavy film noir theme to it game L.A. Noire, so it's got a heavy film noir theme to it now you will be a detective in the trench coat, the fedora hat, maybe a nice tidy smart little dress and a tight fedora hat, who knows it's it's really you know you be the detective of your dreams except a fashion I think yes yes you're you're dirty and drunk no not necessarily drunk I I want to eat, I want my detective to be drunk your detective can be drunk okay Abs absolutely your detective is so drunk that he barely wakes up for the case <laughs> yeah, goes through it all boy yeah so you will sit down. And this gorgeous board will be laid out in front of you, showing L.A. from an isometric view. It is stunning. It, it divides L.A. up into a bunch of different districts. And oh, I, I I talked about this with a number of games, but this is another part of this with a number of games. But this is another one where I would hang the um, the board on the wall if I could, because it's absolutely gorgeous. It looks really good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's got a space along the top where you uh, keep all the evidence cards. So all the evidence in this game is physically produced. It's really good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's got a space along the top where you uh, keep all the evidence cards. So all the evidence in this game is physically produced in cards and they're face down at the start of the game and then the case will tell you when to turn them face up. You've got on the right hand side, you've got a tracker showing a number of days. If you play this start of the game and then the case will tell you when to turn them face up. You've got on the right hand side, you've got a tracker showing a number of days. If you play this solo, you've got 12 days to crack the case. Not unlike Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, where you kind of keep going and for as long as you want to pursue leads, this game gives you a finite time limit and that really changes the experience. Uh, four player, four detectives, in fact, that's five player, I'll get to that. You only have seven days to crack the case, but there's more of you covering more ground, except only one person gets to solve this case. Every other detective gets a dressing down from the chief at the end and gets to suck on dirt. So, essentially, you get your case. The very first case, I'm not going to give any spoiler details away, it's called Blood on the Pier, and it is a case where someone's been murdered, and you have to find out who did it, what they did it with, and why they did it. Like uh, Clue. Yeah, it's it's a pretty straightforward case. It takes place on a, it takes place on a shorter time frame than most of the others. You get less days. So if you're playing with four detectives, you only get four days instead of the usual seven. But it's very doable within that time. Now, on your turn, you get four actions represented by these little cubes that you'll slide around your board. 
you basically can move anywhere th within your district. If you want to transition from one district to another, you need to get to one of the locations that shares both districts, and then you can move into either of the districts. There's even one location on the board that hits three districts at once. So hanging around on the edge of districts is very powerful. Unfortunately for you, you have to start your game at a police You don't get to be like that initially, but you do get to pick which police station you're at when you begin. Then, at a location, you can search it. There's a hundred locations in this game. You can search any of them at all. Now, in the solo game, there's an entry for every single location in the game. And a lot of the time, it's just giving you fun ways of you're wasting your time here, but sure, okay. If you might find a location that's relevant to the case that you think you need to take a look at, like, say, the scene of the crime, you could search that and you may find some evidence there. Personally, I've, I've, uh, I've read your article on it, and it does seem like a really interesting game. I, I really enjoy the, uh, the interrogation mechanic that you will talk about yep. later. But, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> but I, I think that it, has, it seems to have a lot of really interesting bits, and I'm definitely going to, to try and, uh, and play it. Yep. Well, let me, let me carry on. Yes. Sorry. I, I'm only I, just getting to I it. I filled the time while you were drinking. <laughs> yeah. So you can a location with a suspect, search the suspect. You know, immediately just pat them down and uh, have a look to see what they're carrying. And sometimes this will give you evidence. Sometimes they'll just make fun of you because they haven't got anything. Who knows? These people are not always cooperative. But the big thing you can do when you're with a suspect is you can question them. And that's where this game goes about access or a desk sergeant. No, all of a sudden, the, the fifth player, the non-detective, steps into focus. They are the chisel which is a term for lying, cheating, and swindling. The chisel is your case master. The chisel, which is a term for lying, cheating, and swindling. The chisel is your case master, like a GM, like a games master or a dungeon master. They know everything about the case in advance. They have their own little book. They don't just have the, uh, the case briefing. They've got them like a games master or a dungeon master. They know everything about the case in advance. They have their own little book. They don't just have the uh, the case briefing. They've got everything. They know all of it, inside and out, all in advance, and they can reference anything. Now, for the most part, up until now, all they've been doing is been telling you, oh, it's holding these, you get to see these bits of evidence. But once it comes to questioning, the their agenda comes sharply into focus because you see the chisel isn't just a games master, they can win. And they win by obfuscating the case to such murky, muggy mystery that you sit down against a suspect and you will look and you say, okay, well, I'm with this suspect and I'm going to ask them about this piece of evidence. You can only ask about evidence. You have to be very specific. So for example, all I can do if I, if I arrived at the last standee location, is I could turn and I could say, okay, Chisel, I want to ask Alexis my token to make sure I don't need to talk about my banana because for some reason I don't want to talk about my banana. Exactly. So at this point now, the Chisel's first action could be, well, your first action is if you have leverage over the Chisel, which I'll explain in a moment, you could spend that leverage and the Chisel cannot squirm out of this. They have to give you the best moment. You could spend that leverage and the Chisel cannot squirm worm out of this. They have to give you the best possible answer they can. But if you don't do that, then the chisel could slide their, your influence that they have accumulated across and block your question. You can't ask it for the rest. Accumulated across and block your question. You can't ask it for the rest of the day. However, if none of that happens, you get onto the really sweet part, which is they'll take a card, these square conversation cards, and they will put it into an envelope and it will show just the top section, this few sentences, you know, like you've just opened the envelope across the table to you and you pick it up and you read it. And then you look up and you stare at them and you just, you scrutinize every aspect of them. Are they, are they trembling? Is that a tick? Because they could have given you a straight answer. This might be the best possible information you can get on the banana. It might be. This it might but but maybe, maybe there's something better. Maybe you could find out where that banana's from and actually that it's laced with arsenic and it was used as the murder weapon. You don't know, and you have to decide there and then. So you can say, Oh, I accept this, and you can make your notes on your on your grid, on your table, and move on. 
handing that back and move on handing that back or you could turn around and go no you're lying I challenge you and at this point if you've successfully challenged them you'll gain a leverage over the chisel and they have to change it to the best possible answer they can give you so you will get it the, the question card back they can give you so you will get it the, the question card back but it'll say something different brilliant you get it wrong and well you get no extra information obviously because there's nothing more to learn but also the chisel gets leverage over you and can use that to block later lines of inquiry now why all of that's going on while the two of you of you are engaged in this little like non-verbal bit of social deduction of like bluffing double bluffing and triple bluffing everyone else around the table has to have made a decision if they're going to bribe to hear the evidence or not and they they've decided in advance and they put the token face down and the chisels also had to decide if they want to block anyone from can just be like i'm going to give the person asking the question the honest truth but i'm going to block everyone else on the table because they're getting nowhere and i want to i want to mess with this particular one person and make them challenge me because i need leverage over them on something later on and these mind games go back and forth in a really sweet fashion it, it's a detective game that is actually mechanically a game unlike many other detective games which are they're fun like chronicles of crime uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective and Detective A Modern Crime board game are all really sweet experiences but they're not games yeah but they're not games yeah I can, I can concur I, yeah. I just browse through evidence until I accuse the wrong person <laughs> yeah well I, I gotta re just correct myself they're not traditional games in the way that this is this is this is very much an action economy based almost traditional games in the way that this is this is this is very much an action economy based almost euro game with a hefty slice of social deduction but it wouldn't be as good as it is if it what the cases were not there and let me tell you the cases are there and i'm not going to go into the solo mode in full it's very much like a the multiplayer version but it uses a paragraph based chisel sleuth book it's called um, uh, which like you turn to paragraphs to check the various bits of information after referencing tables and stuff it's actually very simple to move through uh, it's also the way I'd recommend you first play this game if you're going to be the chisel because that way you get to play every which normally you can't do in this game but you can play the, as the chisel as many times as you want as long as the detectives are all new to the case which is great this means this is a wonderful game to just bring to a convention and you sit there and you go okay well i'm going to be the chisel and everyone can try and solve these cases and i get to be more and more crafty and devious each time but that like i saying all of that it doesn't mean much if the cases are not good and the cases are amazing so as i said the first case is just a simple murder case straightforward it's meant to be fairly easy to solve it's on the gumshoe difficulty level which is the lowest the second case murder and set is again it's gumshoe uh, so meant to be the simplest but they make it a bit more complex they put in some red herrings and twists and turns and like it isn't you're not going to immediately figure out and be like ah oh, i reckon it's this this and this and have a good shot at being right because you're not going to have all the information you know you you physically have to find the murder weapon motive and you've got to find the suspect and it's not straightforward but it was and on top of that it brought back characters from the first scenario which i thought was great to see them again i was like oh my god it's the same people from the first first scenario and they're still out there doing this stuff i know i know this person i am confident that or that i know this person i'm sure they're guilty and Hey, your expectations can get subverted. Or maybe this time something different happened. They they yeah. were pushed into a situation where they couldn't get back from. Uh, what I really exactly. liked from your explanation is that this is a, a really cooperative game. That's liked from your explanation is that this is a, a really cooperative game that forces people to make deduction together and to to think as a group. I I think that those cool. Um, those cool little elements are, are really interesting and I'm, I'm well, curious about it yeah you can play it as a very cooperative game but but the classic mode that they recommend isn't every detective is racing against each other like this comes in very sharply into focus in the third case heist to nowhere which is when I went from being like oh this is fun I'm enjoying this to oh my goodness 
these guys, they are showboating now with how clever they're being. Say, bank heist gone wrong. Some of the people have been arrested. Somebody's in the wind. You don't even know who one of the suspects is. You've got to find them. And you've got to figure, and the scenario only ends if you find the money. And the first person to find the money wins. <laughs> because they pocket some of it. They, they get to skim a bit of it. They do, yeah. They, they get to skim a bit of it. They do, yeah. But uh, it, 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 it changed the game. And it subverted my expectations in a great way. And also brought in this extra mechanic of mystery cards. And when I finally turned the first one of them round, I, I swore at the designers for being so smart and so clever. I swore at the designers for being so smart and so clever. And then there was a second thing that happened that I'm not going to spoil. But when it did, I was like, oh, you swines. You you absolute swines. This is brilliant. This It felt like I was going through a detective story. And at the end of it, I looked at what I'd figured out and what I'd figured out and what I'd followed. I found the money. Um, and because it's a gumshoe case, you know, like you're probably going to succeed at it. But I could see multiple routes that would have brought me here to this conclusion. And I was like, that's great. That's good for playing against a bunch of other people is you can be following different sets of breadcrumbs just following straight on a single line so oh and i'm not even going to start talking about the veteran level or the hard-boiled level of cases because i don't want to spoil anything about them except to say like the the very next case you do the very first veteran one you have one guy he's walked into the uh, prison uh, into a police station and he said that's it you've got him three locations involved with him and you have to unfold the entire case from there and uh, it's brilliant just They've they've released um, eight additional cases on top of the nine that are in the box. They've got another one coming, and this is so such a clever system. I, I so such a clever system. I, I I could see it having legs and keeping going. So I mean I mean this sounds all really fascinating, but I have one really important question uh, mm -hmm. because I've played one detective game before, detective a modern crime board game. And it's detective game before detective a modern crime board game, and it's the only game I ever played where I specifically say if someone invites me to play this game again, I will decline. Um, do I need to make mind maps to solve the cases? <laughs> no, certainly. But each one of these cases played solo, I, I got through it within an hour. And it's a very clear narrative that I could follow. Nope, no need for no need for the sprawling mind maps where they give you a giant pile of cards for you to place around and figure everything out. Absolutely not. Not that complex. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Um, I know there are mechanics for bribing, for pressuring um, um, people who watched something. How do we say it in English? Uh, witnesses. Witness. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Considering social um, discussions around police brutality a problem, is this in some way addressed in the game or in the rules? Um... That's a fair point. Um, I think given the trappings of this game, it's very hyper movie based. It doesn't feel particularly real at all. Uh, they oh. picked a time period that's based. It doesn't feel particularly real at all. Uh, they oh. picked a time period that's fairly, you know, old and even a fictionalized version of that. Also, I don't think at any time does the game make out that you are really the good guys. It's made fairly clear from the start that you're you're corrupt cops. If I can interject, for the... it's made fairly clear from the start that you're you're corrupt cops. If I can interject for the the little bit that I've I've seen and read the tradition of um noir movie is usually it was very much based in a sort of a one of the first big anti with the, the prohibition and if this follows the, the tradition as, as i've seen in the uh, the little bit that i've read about the game um you know like every police officer is uh, a corrupt dickhead that wants first to to take care of themselves and like the I f I'm going to assume that, you know, and a good guy in the police force, you know, is a statement on its own. Yeah, I think that's a fair thing to say. Yeah, you can get access to information, um, evidence that uh, when a player gets evidence in the multiplayer version, um, 
they squirrel it away for three days and you can't get access to it days and you can't get access to it until those three days have passed but you can get to it early by bribing you can either go to the location that the other officer is at with the evidence and you pay them to scratch they can't refuse they take the money yeah there's no like being good about this they will take the money and you get to see the evidence or you can go to any police station they will take the money and you get to see the evidence or you can go to any police station and bribe the desk sergeant for three scratch so yep absolutely every single cop in this seems to be dirty there's sections where you're told to tread very lightly with a uh, woman who runs um a uh, the, 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 what do you call it a whole house you know just to be completely blunt about it that she may have uh, like who knows what's in her book so don't mess with her because that she may even have police names in there so i i don't think they um they tread lightly about this. I think it's very much a fictionalized world where every, yeah, every, every bad. Yeah. So yeah, for me, for me, it wasn't um, too much of an issue. Okay. Yeah. But, but that's maybe something for, for people with uh, bad experiences to, to look out for and uh, keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just, I, I, I feel they've fictionalized the setting and the experience and it's enough for me, but yeah, I can understand some people may, may want to avoid this as likewise, you probably don't want to play this game with, um, young kids. Um, you would probably want to play through a case beforehand to see whether you'd be okay with it, but at least it doesn't have the same problem micro macro crime city has in that my kids game. And then you play a few of the cases and you're like, Ooh, no, that's, that's, that's not what I want my kids to, uh, yeah, to experience. St stuff gets dark fast. Yeah, it does. It does. This is, th this opens up pretty dark and, um, the first case itself, you know, is a murder case and I, I'd spoil it more, but it does ink them. They don't hold back. Okay. Well, I think that is all we have time for here today. So you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or as the last standee on Twitter. And it's goodbye from Alexis. From Belgium. Au revoir. Alessio. Bye bye, everyone. Cara. Oh. From Germany. Auf Wiedersehen. And myself. Bye. And remember that the second E in standee is for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs>